It's about God's heart. And the Word talks an awful lot about uh, finances and, and about where our heart goes and how we want to control things. We think that we've earned money, so we think we should be able to control something in our life. But what God says is He wants to control everything in our life. So before I speak, I, I just ask that we would pray. Father God, I thank you and praise you for who you are, your very heart of generosity, your heart for us. Not uh, you, you have a heart that leans always for us and towards us, never under guilt or compulsion, but you always are for us. So Father, I pray that you would move this broken girl aside. I pray that you would uh, allow what comes out of my lips to be what you once said to the dear people here in Elizabethtown. So, Father, we thank you for what you're going to do in and through us, and we will give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm part of a, I hope I don't, I hope I don't uh, cough and all that kind of stuff. I've had bronchitis for about three weeks now, so I'm trying to re recover from that. So if I start to uh, cough, please excuse me. Um, I'm part of an association of church business administrators, and to some of you that might seem very, very boring. And sometimes it really is. But I get to go every now and then to um, a national convention, and I was there this summer, and we were on the National Mall down outside of Washington, D.C. It was really cool. Uh, down there. I've never been down there before. Um, but we had this one speaker that was going to speak to us, and his name is Dr. Alan Walworth. And he's with an organization that I know really well. They're called Generis. And what their organization does is they go out to churches and they try to get them to understand what biblical generosity is and, and how they can do things through their community of faith uh, to impact the world for Jesus Christ. Um, so he, he gets into a lot of churches and he's really, really got this organization that I really value. The two people that work for him wrote a book called Contagious Generosity, and it's about the church and how within your body of faith that you can grow and, and lead and be excited and thrilled about reaching the lost beyond your walls through generosity. And so he was about ready to register for this convention, and he went into the hotel, and the lady behind the desk, and she said, oh, you're Dr. Alan Walworth. Oh, you're with a company called Generous? And he went to his room, and he thought, well, that would have been really clever, right, to name your company Generous when that was really their whole theme, is what they do. But he, they didn't. And then, but he went to his room that night, and he thought, am I really... Am I, am I really a generous person? Am I generous with what God has given to me? Am I really? Now, in our world today, it seems that we've got a lot of tight fists happening. Now, on the next slide, you're going to see some pictures come up. And the first one that'll pop up is a few weeks ago, we had a uh, really tragic thing happen in Las Vegas, right? There was a man in a hotel room with a tight fist around a gun and thought he had the right to shoot at innocent people. Also in the news over the last few months, there's been a lot of hubbub about the NFL players who are, are dishonoring our national anthem. Some of them are raising a fist, a tight fist into the air while that is being played or, or bending a knee, whatever their protest was. And that's all we heard about in the news. During that same time, did any of you hear of this man's name, Robert Engel? Robert Engel. During this same time where all we're hearing about in the news about these NFL players who are being disrespectful, Robert Engel was a hero in the Antioch Church in Nashville, Tennessee. He actually disarmed a tight fist around a gun from a man who was trying to annihilate and kill people within his congregation, Robert Engel. But we didn't hear about that. All we're hearing is the negative. How about the tight fists that we have around our own cash, right? Uh, we're coming up at Christmas time, and we're going to go into various stores, and we're going to walk by that red kettle, you know, where they're ringing the bell, and we don't even want to make eye contact with these people when we could just put like a little coin in or, or whatever it is. But we do that because we have this tight fist around our own resources. 
or a tight fist whenever we see the kids with the cans, you know, for Thon. We don't want to make eye contact with them because we have this tight fist around our own resources. Now, there was um, something that happened, a few things that happened to Christ before he, he walked that very, very narrow and lonely path to the cross. And one of the things that happened were he was with his disciples and, and he told two of them, he said, look, buddies, he goes, I need you to go into the town and you're going to find a donkey there, a brand new donkey, this colt. And it probably still had that new donkey smell, you know, and the sticker on the rump, right? And you're going to go there and you're going to take that donkey because the Lord has need of it, all right? Now, your brand new car that's tied to a post somewhere with the new car smell and the sticker still on the window, somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I need that. I need that ride, right? So the, the disciples are probably thinking, this is craziness. You know, I, I can't believe he's asking us to do this. But then he said, tell them the Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it. So they obeyed and they went to town and they found this colt, this brand new colt, you know, really, really cool, never ridden, tied there. The owner was there. He said, the Lord has need of it. And he untightened his hand from that rain and gave it to him. That's crazy. But the Lord had need. A tight fist had to let it go so that scripture could be fulfilled. In Zechariah 9, see your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. No one had ever ridden on it. Fulfilling scripture that was written a long, long time before. A tight fist, a generous moment, a generous opportunity. For the Lord had need. The Lord had need. Very, very cool. Now in Matthew 26, 7 to 3, if you have your word with you, you're welcome to follow along. I'm going to read this scripture. And this is from uh, Matthew 26, 7 to 13, where there was another open palm before Jesus walked that narrow path to the cross. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. Now, this alabaster jar that this woman had, this very expensive perfume would have been like a year's salary. Very, very expensive. And she had this generous heart, this open palm that she could not be stopped from pouring it over someone she deeply loved. An open palm of generosity to the Jesus that she loved. She could not be stopped from doing this generous act. Can you imagine him? For, to begin with, they were reclining at the table, which was how they ate. That's how they supped. That's, that's how they did dinner. It was like they were reclining. Their feet would have been out towards the back, not under the table. And she poured this amazing perfume. Imagine the aroma that went out into the room. It would have been incredible because it was a whole jar, a very lavish, extravagant gift that she could not be stopped from doing because she loved him so dearly and he had not yet died for her. He had not yet died for her. How can we be stopped from doing the same? Being generous in a way that is so lavish and extravagant to show the whole world what he's done. For he is the most generous. It's God's whole story. Generosity from the very beginning of scripture until the very end. A heart of generosity. What he wants for us not from us. It's so true. He, it's not something he wants from you. He wants it 
for you. You were made for it. I love to study about it. It's really crazy. There's the, the University of Notre Dame. Some of you may have heard me tell this story before. The University of Notre Dame actually has a, a, an area where they are studying generosity. And they give out grants for people who are um, studying it so that they can discover more about it. Like, why? You know, what's so cool about it? What's not cool about it? That kind of a thing. There was an uh, article in there that was uh, a paper that was written. They had taken some subjects and they had placed them into MR an MRI. And while they were doing that, they gave them the opportunity to be generous. I don't know whether it was online giving or how it was they were, but they were able to do with these resources, with this money, anything they wanted. They could even keep some of it. But what happened was they were generous while they were doing this. And as they were scanning their brains while they were being generous, consistently the center of the brain where dopamine is manufactured, manufactured where pleasure resides, lights up. You were hardwired for it by the creator. He made you for it. We just need to tap into it. We need to address the fear that Satan has put on us, especially in the church. We don't even want to talk about it. We act like it shouldn't be talked about here. We don't mind talking about it with our banker, Bob Ank. We don't mind talking about it with our investment person. But when we start to talk about our resources in the church, somehow we get all bristly. When actually, it's what God wants for us, not from us. He made us for it. It's an amazing thing that we need to address the fear and not let Satan have a hold there any longer. But what happened to this woman when she was very generous, when she took this very expensive perfume and poured it over the one she loved, what happened was the finance committee had a meeting. When the disciples saw this, it says, they were indignant. Why this waste? This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you'll always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Think about that. She didn't even know he was going to die. She did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth. Wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. She got it. She understood who Jesus was. An unsolicited, generous act out of love for someone who had not even died yet. Think about that. I think Jesus, because this was days before, I think when he went to the cross and he opened his palms for you and me, I think the smell of that perfume was still on him. That generous act poured out upon him as he went to die for you and me. It's the story of the gospel. Generosity. It's God's story for us, not from us. An act of love for someone who had not yet died. Imagine that. An open palm for a donkey, for, an, for a parade that had not yet happened. There were other generous things that happened to Jesus before he went to the cross. There was a donated upper room where he could say goodbye to his buddies. Where they could have the Last Supper together from a donated gift. And then in the end, a donated tomb for him to lay and then be raised again. It's God's story for you. And he wants us to be generous, to show others his story. It's so cool. I really believe in this dark day that we are living in. This is the evangelism that we must embrace. If we 
all became a generous people, the world will go, what's up with that? <laughs> if every one of us did that, because actually what happened was, in Acts, read it, in Acts what happened was the new believers, the new, the new church, they upended the world because they were a generous people and gave to anyone as had need. Not just some, anyone as had need. And in that dark Roman day and in that dark Roman world, it upended the world. That's why there were so many people that came to Christ during that time, because of this motley crew that became a generous people. It can be our hallmark again. I believe it. I believe that's how we can make an imprint now. It can start really simple. Start noticing people. One way. I mean, I love little people, like little children, because they'll look you in the eye, right? And they don't turn away until you turn away. But they will look at you in the eye. They notice you. They read you. Start noticing people. When you go to the grocery store, <clears throat> there's a checkout person that's swiping your groceries unless you went to the self-serve you know, area. But <clears throat> they, they have a name tag on. Call them by their name. I was recently with somebody, and they, I don't know if they were a grocery checker or a, a, a waitress or whatever they were, and, and I mentioned this comment to her, and she goes, you know, it stuns me when somebody calls me by my name, and I think, whoa, how do they, how do they know my name? It makes a difference. Acknowledging people, noticing them, and I believe what happens to us as a body of believers. If we start to notice people, you'll start to see area of need. This is how it works. This is what God wants for you, not from you. It doesn't take much. I get to go out to uh, dinner sometimes with a bunch of pastors, which is kind of fun. You know, I'm, I have lots of stories if you ever want to know. And, uh, and one time we were all together and there was a, um, we were at a restaurant and we were going to pray for our meal. You know, of course they, you know, would do that, you would hope. And uh, one of the pastors turned to our waiter and he said, um, first we had asked him his name and he told us his name was Tom. And, and he said, Tom, we're going to be praying for our meal here in a little bit. Is there, is there anything we can pray for you for? And he went, well, yeah. He goes, my mom just died. That little thing, you don't know what impact that had on that person. You know, but then you leave a really good tip too, right? Y you, d you do that because they've just served you. I believe that this act of generosity can start with you by just beginning to notice people. And then God will show you ways that you can be financially generous if you are supposed to do that. I do believe it is possible. There's an interesting person that um, came to conference sessions one time to speak. His name is Shane Claiborne. You might remember him, Dave. He's really kind of a radical kind of person in, near the Philadelphia area. He does these really cool, out-of-the-box community things to try to get his community to know Jesus. And he said this. Here's the deal. Generosity cannot be forced or legislated. It has to be provoked by love. I love that. It should never be out of guilt or compulsion. If you feel guilty and you are only giving your resources, your tithe, which is 10% to your local body, anything above that, generosity, if you are giving because you feel guilty, you should keep your money. You should keep it. Because what God really wants is what's in here. He wants you to trust and know that if you give your resources away, he's going to meet your need. Sometimes he'll even give you some of your wants. I'm not kidding you. It's how it works. It's what God wants for you, not from you. Now, this speaker that uh, spoke to us down in Washington, D.C., you know, he gets to go out to a lot of churches and uh, gets to be a consultant to them. And he was checking in on one of his churches, which was in Destin, Florida. It was the United Methodist Church in Destin, Florida. And the pastor had said to him, hey, I think this generosity thing's starting to catch on. And he goes, yeah, really? Tell me about it. 
And so he told this story. And there was a men's Bible class there at this Destin United Methodist Church. And there was one guy in the Bible study who was in charge of donuts every week because you, apparently you can't study the Word of God without donuts. And so it was his job to go get these donuts every Sunday. And so he went to the local Dunkin' Donuts, you know, he goes to the drive-in, does his order, he pulls up. Well, here the girl had messed up the order. And this guy was not nice to her. Eventually she started to cry. And then he noticed her and saw that she was very pregnant and very young. Took the donuts. You know, the Holy Spirit was just beating him up the whole way to the Bible study because he also had realized that on his bumper was a bumper sticker that said, follow me to Destin United Methodist Church. Ouch. So he goes to the Bible study and he goes, guys, I really messed up. He goes, I, I really messed up. He goes, but this is what I'm going to do. He goes, next week, he goes, and if any of you want to join me, that'd be great. He goes, but next week, I'm going to go and get the donuts, but whenever I get them from her, I'm going to hand into her a baby gift. Because I get the feeling that she's not married, she's very, very young, she's very, very scared, and I'm, I just get the feeling that nobody's going to do anything for her. And I really messed up, and I want to make it right. So, next week comes, he goes to the drive-in, he hands in a gift while there were 47 other cars behind him. All from Destin United Methodist Church. All who handed in a baby gift. And all who had a bumper sticker on their car that said, follow me to Destin United Methodist Church. And she did. <laughs> Noticing people, seeing need, what God wants for us, <laughs> not from us. His very heart, generosity. Let's pray.